This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. All right, number 11. And incidentally, uh, the next few of these are all ones which I regard as uh, being very quick. Uh, because they're all very short, and uh, none of them involve any calculations. And they're ones that hopefully, I know it takes time to read, especially um, if English is your second or third language, but apart from the time it takes to read, um, if you've been studying properly, uh, you should find them very quick indeed to actually get the answer. Or, as I said earlier, uh, if you come to one, you realise that you don't understand what they've written, or you, you've forgotten that section of the syllabus, or it's something you've never studied, which I hope is not the case, uh, then again, there's pointless wasting time, uh, you guess. So the next few, you should be able to get through very quick. Uh, number 11, to show you what I mean. Which of the above sentences are our true? The following steps have been made about standard costing and total quality management. One, they focus on assigning responsibility solely to senior managers. Well, that's not really anything to do with it. Um, total quality management is um, improving quality, having less wastage, that sort of thing. Uh, but it's nothing to do with who's solely responsible. Number one, isn't true. Number two, they work well in rapidly changing environments. Uh, Talk about management does involve keep changing because we keep always trying to improve ourselves, but standard costing, no. Um, standard costing, you know, we keep the same cost not forever, but certainly for several periods, but if things are rapidly changing, uh, the standard cost rapidly becomes out of date and therefore becomes fairly useless. So neither of the two are true. The answer, therefore, is C. Number 12, another which of the following above statements is or are true, environmental costing. Number one, the majority of environmental costs are already captured within a typical organisation's accounting system. What does that mean? I mean? Already captured, already recorded. The difficulty lies in identifying them. Well, that's true. I mean, environmental costs are things like the cost of um, cleaning up if we've um, uh, damaged the environment. Well, like any cost. Uh, if you've had a cost to be recorded. I mean, some of them might be harder, you know, the, the possibility of fines and things. If you've not actually had a fine, it won't have been recorded, necessarily. But certainly the majority of them, they will be recorded, just as all costs are recorded. So number one's true. Number two, input-output uh, analysis divides material flows into three categories, material flows, system flows, delivery and disposal flows. They're trying to confuse you. Uh, input analysis, output analysis itself doesn't split them into three categories. It looks overall at what goes in and what comes out. Um, it doesn't divide them into these categories. So number two isn't true. Uh, the answer, therefore, it's only one. The answer is A. Number 13. Uh, which of the above targets satisfy, uh, sorry, which of the above targets assesses economy, efficiency and effectiveness? Uh, now, I know some people have problems with the words efficiency and effectiveness because in some languages they sort of translate into the same word. Um, if that does cause you a problem, yet again, listen to the lecture where I do hopefully uh, make the distinction between the two. But let's apply it here. Um, DEF provides accounting services to government departments. On average, each staff member works six chargeable hours with the rest of the working day on non-chargeable admin work. One of the main objectives is to produce a high level of quality and customer satisfaction. <clears throat> the three targets there, 
So it's a question of which target is economy, which is efficiency, which is effectiveness. Number one, cutting expenditure by 5%. Well, simply cutting expenditure is an economic target. It's economy. So number one is economy. It's not making uh, necessarily more efficient. It's not certainly not necessarily making us more effective. It's purely economy, cut costs. Uh, number two, increasing the number of chargeable hours to 6.2 a day. At the moment, they're only working six hours a day chargeable. The rest is admin. Uh, and so we want them to work more efficiently. And spend less time on admin, spend more time on actual work that can be charged. And so that is efficiency. And I think, yes, looking at the choices, we already know the answer now, but just a completeness, number three. And this, again, if you're happy with the distinction between efficiency and effectiveness, um, this should be very obvious. Obtaining a score of 4.7 or above on customer satisfaction services, you see our aim is to produce high level of quality and satisfaction. So that's what we're trying to achieve. Effectiveness is how well you're actually succeeding in achieving your objectives. And so getting a high score is measuring how well we're succeeding or the effectiveness. Hey, certainly a half, sorry, so the answer, I beg your pardon, one, two, three, the answer therefore is D. Um, what I'm about to say, I've half said already, but one nice thing there actually is even if one of those three statements confused you or worried you, if you get any two of them right, then you automatically get all three right, if you understand me. So, you know, if you read number two and thought, oh, I have no idea, Ooh. you know, you, you got that economy, you can't decide if number two is economy, is efficiency or effectiveness. Uh, why not jump? And number three, ah, if that's effective, well, number two has to be efficiency. Fourteen, yet another, what I call written ones, in the sense there's no arithmetic involved. Oh, well, very, very, very standard. There's not much excuse here for not getting this one. Which of the following is an advantage of non-participative budgeting as compared to participative? If you remember, participative budgeting is where, we, if I'm in charge of the budget process, I get the managers to produce their own budgets and I coordinate them and I put them together. But they're involved in producing the budgets. Non-participative is where I prepare the budgets and just give them to the managers. I don't ask them at all. I just tell them, you'll do this, you'll do this, you'll do this. Make sure you've read it the right way around. What's an advantage of non-participative budgeting? A, it increases motivation? No, quite the reverse. If managers aren't involved, they're going to be less motivated. Uh, B, it's less time consuming? Yes. Although uh, it's much more motivating if the managers are involved, it takes time for them to prepare their own budgets. It then takes me more time to argue with them, to fit them all together and so on. Uh, participative is more time consuming. Non-participative, it's less time consuming, it is an advantage. I've got the answer now, but let's just check the other two. C, it increases acceptance? No. If you prepare your own budget and agree it with me, since you prepared it, you're going to accept it. But non-participative, if I just give you a budget and you've had no say in it, you're less likely to accept it. Uh, D, the budget's more attainable. Well, no. You know, you're the expert in your department. You're more likely to come up with a budget that can be achieved because you understand your particular department better than perhaps I do. 
So the answer is, I might be able to be Uh, 15, yet again. Oh, it's, sorry, keep talking, but number 14, for example. I think number 14, a few minutes to read, otherwise I think fairly quick. And I hope that's one of the easier ones. That's what I meant at the very beginning of all of this. But there is that danger. Some of the earlier ones took quite a long time, the arithmetic. But number 18, sorry, not number 18, what I'm talking about. Number Oh, forget it, but something took a, a quite a long time both to read and then do the numbers. It would have been awful to have spent 10 minutes on one of the earlier ones and never had time to do number 14. When in the time it took for one of the earlier ones, you could have done two or three of these short ones. You know, again, they're all two marks. Anyway, 15. The following are all steps in the implementation of target costing process, which is the correct sequence. Oh, I, I hate these, you know, going around, is it, is it one first, two first, and so on, but still. Um, again, very textbook. About the 20th time, you should have learned target costing. I hope you've been through the lecture and the notes, and I go through the steps. But with target costing, uh, the first thing always is we set the selling price, number four. That comes first. It's the selling price that ultimately drives uh, the cost we're trying to achieve. Uh, once we've set the selling price, we then decide how much profit we want to make. So number three. Now, I'm going to carry on. From the point of view of time pressure, keep your eye on the um, choices. Um, it's automatic. Price first, then profit, and then we go down to cost. It has to be four first and three second. The answer, look at the choices. The answer has to be C. It has to be. Be confident. All right, I will go through the others, but don't waste time in the exam. If you've finished all 20, you can come back and double check. But let's carry on. Uh, having got the profit, uh, we then put the two together. We know the price, we know what profit we want. And so we calculate what the cost, the maximum cost would have to be, the target cost. Uh, once we've got a target cost, that's the cost that we want to achieve. We look to see uh, what we estimate the costs are actually going to be. Uh, number two, calculate the estimated current cost based on existing specification. So that's the cost we want to achieve. That at the moment is what it's actually going to cost. And then we look at the difference between the two, the cost gap. I'm turning this into a mini lecture, but if the target was making up a figure, if we had to um, pay no more than $10 a unit to achieve our target, if, if on existing specifications it looks as though it's going to cost $12, ah, there's a gap of $2. And our job then will be to find a way of reducing the actual cost, of reducing the cost gap of getting it down to zero. Anyway, the answer is C. Uh, 